Hi guys, it's me, Crystal. I uh, hope everybody's having a good week. Um, if you are a returning subscriber, yay, hi guys. Um, I hope you enjoyed the last series. I know it was exhausting. It was actually exhausting for me too, for three whole weeks, that's all I could think about. Um, so I hope you guys liked it. And if you are new to this channel, hi. Um, I hope everything is going well for you and I hope you'll stay tuned and really enjoy these movies and we can really make something good out of this. Um, so hopefully you guys will like, um, turn on the notification bell that sometimes rings and sometimes doesn't, subscribe and share if you want to or leave me comments. Um, if you guys are going to leave comments, remember just no hate. There's enough hate in the world already. We don't need to have any more down in the section. We're just here to talk and discuss ideas. <clears throat> and yes, I am wearing the fourth of my ugly Christmas sweaters. I just want to show you it actually lights up. So there you go. Um, but I won't have that on today because it's a little bit distracting. Um, so when I was doing research for this week, you know, I had a couple different cases that I wanted to touch on. And then I realized that we've done a lot of stuff in Ontario. Um, we've done some stuff in BC. We were in Quebec. We were in Alberta. But we haven't touched on any of the other provinces or territories. And this is a Canadian true crime channel. So I decided to research a case from Manitoba and I got really into it so hopefully guys this video won't be as long as the other ones and uh, let's I guess sit back and get ready and enjoy. Um, these videos are for entertainment or educational purposes only um, and also I just want to remind you guys that this might have some triggering aspects in it. It does um, include a young girl and um, the things that happened to her so hopefully um, if it does trigger anybody, I would suggest maybe not watching this um, video. So today we're going to talk about Carrie Ann Brown. And Carrie Ann Brown was actually born August 19th of 1971. Um, her parents are Jim and Ann Brown. And she has two brothers. Ian, who is four years older than her, was a half-brother. And she has a brother, Trevor, who is a year older than her. Um, they originally lived in Berks Falls, Ontario. But I think it was when um, Carrie was about three or four, they moved to Thompson, Manitoba. Um, the reason being was that uh, Jim took a job at Inco, which was one of the um, large nickel mines in Thompson. Uh, Thompson at that time uh, was known for its nickel mining. Um, I'm not sure if the industry is still uh, going on to the extent it was or to what extent the industry still goes on today, but back then in the 70s and 80s, nickel mining was really big there. And Anne actually got a job as um, a medical transcriptionist uh, for records at one of the local hospitals. Um, Carrie was five foot one, 110 pounds. She had curly blonde hair and blue eyes. I'm just gonna bring up a picture of her for you guys. Just waiting for it to load, I'm sorry guys. So this is Carrie, I'm trying to get it so that, there we go, that's the best way. Um, and she was uh, small but mighty. That's what people describe her as. Um, she was very athletic. Um, she liked running a lot and she was really fast. Um, and gym was actually her favorite class. Um, she was very generous and giving. The night that she disappeared, uh, one of her friends needed a belt. So Carrie took her own belt and gave that to her friend. Uh, years later, the friend did give it back to the family. Uh, Carrie loved to collect stuffed animals. Um, her favorite one was a big brown bear named Coco and the belt um, Trevor actually keeps around the bear because there's so few things that they have left of Carrie. Um, Carrie had a lot of friends. Uh, she was also described as somebody who could have a bit of a temper, but it was only when she was sticking up for people. That was something that Carrie did a lot. Um, she always tried to stick up for anybody that was being picked on or bullied, and she had no qualms about doing it. It did not matter who the person was, she would stand up for, and speak for that person. Um, Carrie was just like every other girl. Uh, she went to school. Um, she was in grade 10 uh, at this particular time and she was 15 years old. So this was 1986. Uh, we're going to get into the night into a couple in a couple minutes. Um, she liked to listen to music. She liked to hang out with friends uh, and just do normal things that every other kid did. Um, the night in question 
was October 16th, 1986. And Carrie had gone to school that day. This was a Thursday. Um, the next day was a Friday, but it was a PA day. And that night, uh, Carrie and two of her friends, uh, Rhonda uh, Tennant and Nicole Zorodsky, uh, had decided to go to a party at their friend Doug Crossick's house. Um, they had gone to Doug's house many times before. Uh, his basement was like a place for kids to go and hang out. They'd just talk and listen to music, just normal things like that. And uh, they left for the party at about 7 p.m. They just walked there. The party was on Trout Avenue, which was only like a couple blocks from Carrie's house. Um, they got to the party. Everything was fine. Everybody was hanging out. Uh, um, Nicole remembers that at one point in time, um, Carrie was actually sitting on her lap. They were having a good time. And then Carrie saw her ex-boyfriend. Uh, now, this is a recent ex-boyfriend. They had only broken up within the past few days. And he was actually there with another girl. Um, this girl was someone he had dated prior to Carrie. And it is believed he broke up with her so he could... Uh, he broke up with Carrie so he could redate this girl. Um, there was no bad blood. Nothing terrible happened. No arguments, no confrontations. Uh, they didn't even speak to each other. But Carrie felt really awkward and uncomfortable because he was there. So she wanted to go. Um, she said to Nicole, um, it's time to leave. Now that night she was going to be spending the night at Nicole's house because of the PA day the next day. Um, so the girls actually got outside the door when Nicole realized she'd forgotten her purse. So she went back downstairs to get it. Now at this point in time, Carrie was inside the door, like near the steps. And Nicole ran into her ex-boyfriend and they had kind of like a conversation, if you will. I've heard arguing. I've heard they were able to calm down. So they had an interaction. This was only about a 10 minute interaction. But Doug remembers seeing uh, Carrie by the door and that Carrie really wanted to go. And Doug remembers telling Carrie uh, to not go out by herself, to wait for Nicole and not leave and walk home on her own. Um, it's also interesting to note that Carrie did not take an overnight bag with her when she went to the party, uh, even though she was supposed to be staying with Nicole. Uh, Carrie was someone that often liked to change her clothing, so this was really out of character with her, but she did not bring an overnight bag. Um, Doug remembers that Carrie asked him to go and look uh, for Nicole, which he did. He went downstairs. This was the last time he saw Carrie. Now, um, it should be also noted that though Thompson... Um, would be like a smaller type of city. Um, they would get the influx from everywhere, like uh, people from small towns or from the reserves would come here because it was like the larger city, so to speak. It was the city, so to speak. Um, Thompson actually is one of Canada's most dangerous uh, places for violent crimes. Uh, in 2018, it ranked number two. So this place is a place that has known violent crimes. Uh, Doug's advice was very good that Carrie should have stayed in the house, but she was 15. She she wanted to get out of there. That's what happened. Um, so when Doug came back, obviously Carrie was gone and Nicole was only upstairs a couple minutes later. She figured uh, that Carrie was outside waiting for her and that she was probably going to get an earful because of the 10 minute conversation she had with the ex-boyfriend. She opened the door, looked outside. Carrie was completely gone. The only thing that was remaining was a set, a single set of footprints that led all the way down the driveway to a set of fresh tire tracks. Now, Nicole at this point in time didn't start panicking. She figured that Carrie had just walked to her own home. But Nicole did her due diligence. She checked around the streets. Um, she came back to the party a couple different times. I've heard that she looked for Carrie for about an hour and a half that night until she realized that she was over her own curfew. So she went home. Uh, the next day, I think it was at 10 in the morning, she called Carrie's home. And when Anne answered, she said, you know, is Carrie there? And Anne basically said, uh, no, she's supposed to be with you. Um, so Carrie and Anne, or sorry, Nicole and Anne both started calling around uh, to different friends' places and uh, other places like that to see if they could find Carrie. Uh, Jim went out and also went looking for her. It was about four o'clock. Um, that afternoon when she was reported missing to the RCMP. Um, that's that's the detachment that you get a hold of is the RCMP. Um, and 
people went to go and look for Carrie. Um, Nicole has severe PTSD and survivor's guilt because of this. Uh, she can't stop thinking about these things and she had had a handle on it, um, but it, it creeps up like PTSD does at any point in time. So I do feel really bad for Nicole. They were only 15 years old. Um, you know, in lots of towns this happens. I, I can't even recall how many times I walked home by myself in my town, which is very small, um, at two and three in the morning, because when you're a kid, you feel like you're invisible and you feel like, you know, it doesn't happen to me. So about less than 40 hours later, around 40 hours later, uh, at about 2 p.m. in the afternoon, so this would now be October 18th, when the kids left the party, when Nicole and um, Carrie were deciding to leave, it was around midnight. So this is the, you know, the cutoff point when the 16th becomes the 17th. So this is now October 18th. Two women were horseback riding. Uh, one was Donna Kovic and another was her friend. And uh, they were in a wooded area just outside of Thompson. Now this wooded area is not very close to the highway and it's kind of secluded. It's also a party place for kids. Um, you would basically have to know the area pretty well to get into this. Um, there's a set of stables that are there and there's only one road that leads in and out. I'm gonna refer to this road as Stable Road. Um, that's what I heard uh, it referred to. I'm not sure of the actual name of the road, so we're just gonna call it Stable Road. Um, there's a graveyard that's in there as well and it's heavily wooded and at this point in time it was muddy. Um, now I said before on the 16th there was snow um, in Thompson, Manitoba. That's how you could see the footprints. Uh, it's northernmost, so yes, in October there will be snow. Uh, I'm not sure if global warming has done anything about that, but at that point in time, yes, there was snow on the ground. But uh, by the 18th, it was fairly muddy. Uh, they had just passed the graveyard, uh, Donna and her friend, when the horses started acting up that they were riding on. Um, so they stopped to look around, and the friend actually said, is that a mannequin? So they went over to look and Donna noticed it was not a mannequin. It was the body of a young girl. She bent down and checked the vitals and the young girl was deceased. So she went uh, to go and get the RCMP. When RCMP came back to the site, um, they noticed that the young girl, who was later identified by her dad as Carrie. This was Carrie's body. Um, and this was about a kilometer away from the actual horse stables near some hydropower lines. She was laying on her jacket. Um, she had one hand up and one hand down. Um, she was dressed in pink and black leopard print uh, outfit um, and she had white socks on. Um, her head, her face, and her upper body were severely, severely beaten. And police were able to ascertain that despite the fact that she was dressed now, um, she had been raped. Uh, they believe that the weapons used to beat Carrie were actual branches that were found at the scene because there were blood-stained branches found at the scene. They also noted that there was a set of, uh, they look like um, basketball sneakers, but only partial prints. It looked like someone had been trying to push a vehicle out of the mud because remember it was very muddy. They also found a red and blue air mattress at the spot um, and a black rubber car mat that had, they both had sticks underneath of them and they also looked like they were used to help get a vehicle unstuck from the mud. Um, <clears throat> when police did bring uh, Carrie back to the hospital uh, for everything, um, they loaded her up in a body bag. Now both police and Donna, I'm not sure how Donna knew, say that the crime scene was contaminated. Um, it appears that the contamination, because I don't know much more about um, any other contamination, was due to the body bag. Um, body bags in the 80s, 70s, all the way down, were often reused. Um, maybe they weren't cleaned out as well. Um, so multiple bodies could have been in the bag before Carrie was. That is a source of the contamination. However, police were able to locate um, DNA. Um, this was 86 though. So at the time they, they didn't test it at that time. That was later. Um, and, um, uh, it was a very, very 
sad time for Thompson. It actually destroyed Thompson in certain ways. Um, it definitely destroyed the family. Uh, Anne died 15, later, 15 years later, but she had fallen into a deep depression and she had developed cancer and she died of cancer without ever knowing what happened to her daughter that night. Um, she knew her daughter was dead, but she didn't know who did it. Uh, Jim and Trevor actually still live in Thompson. And the, the kids at school, uh, this was R.D. Parker Collegiate School. Um, remember when I said that they had all gone to a party at Doug's house that night. There were only 24 people or so at this party. It was chaperoned. There was a little bit of booze, not a whole lot, just some beer. Um, and all of these people knew each other. Um, they weren't all in the same grade. Uh, Doug was actually a year older than Carrie. He was closer to Trevor's age, but they did all know each other from R.D. Parker Collegiate. They had all gone to school together. Uh, the school itself rallied for the police and for city council to make the streets of uh, Thompson safer because of this. And they were actually able to raise enough money to make a scholarship in Carrie's, aunt, in Carrie's name. So the Carrie Brown Memorial um, scholarship bursary. It's actually the Carrie Ann Memorial Bursary is still ongoing in Thompson and it is awarded every year to um, a graduating student with the highest GPA. Uh, Carrie was very well liked and very well loved in the community. Um, there are a couple strange things to note. So that night, which would be, I'm going to say it's the 17th now because it was past midnight. Um, that night, two witnesses, one was uh, Sean Simmons the and there was another witness, um, saw two cars. Uh, they had just been driving around and they saw two cars, two vehicles leaving the entrance of Stable Road. Uh, the vehicles had their lights off, but when they turned the lights back on, on they were able to ascertain sean was that the first vehicle was uh like a either a greenish brown or a green brown um muscle car from the 70s and he could see that the driver was a slight guy with roughly hair um his passenger didn't get a good look at, at, at the person so that's why um he basically stays out of that and they were also able to note that a white van was following this car. Um, they did, of course, tell the RCMP um, when they found out that Carrie um, had been found um, off of Stable Road. So lights off and they were driving. Um, the second thing is that on the night of the 17th, at about 2 a.m., RCMP detachment in um, Thompson got a phone call and the dispatcher's name at that time uh, is Marnie Schaefer and the phone call basically just stated I've just killed someone. There were no details. The person obviously didn't give their name. Uh, they were very panicked. Uh, they sounded like they were worried that Marnie was recording the call which she was and they asked for a specific officer that was actually working in um, Norway Head, um, uh, the Norway Head uh, RCMP detachment. I just wanna make sure that I have that right. Just give me one second, guys. I'm gonna call it Norway Head. Yeah, it was Norway Head. And uh, they asked for the specific um, officer. Now, uh, the Norway head or Norway house, sorry, it was Norway house. Um, and it, it's part of the Cree nation detachment. That's uh, the RCMP up there. Um, they asked for the specific officer um, who obviously was not working with Marnie. But when Marnie did get a hold of the officer and gave him the tape, he could not identify this voice. Um, now, the recording was pretty grainy and poor quality, so that could be the reason why he couldn't identify this voice. Uh, Marnie says it sounds like it was somebody that had a, um, a Northern Indigenous ac uh, accent, so it could have been someone from the reserve calling about a crime. Um, like I said, there are no specifics, although it is interesting to note that during this time in Thompson and the surrounding area, there were no other murders aside from Carrie's. Um, 
and no other missing people, I don't think, aside from Carrie at this point in time in Thompson or the surrounding area. None were recorded. However, this was 14 hours before Carrie was found. Um, there's a lot of controversy surrounding the tape because the original investigating officers do not believe that they ever saw the tape. In fact, they deny the tape's existence. Um, they were two people uh, named John Tost. The other one was Dennis Held. And both of them have said that they've never heard about the tape. They've certainly never listened to the tape. Um, if they had, they would have checked out the tape. However, Marnie says that she did try to give them the tape. She told them about the tape and tried to give them the tape. And they basically told her um, they had a suspect that they were pretty confident in, so they didn't need to hear the tape. Uh, regardless, the tape sat on Marnie's desk for about a month and then it too disappeared. Um, there is no other recording of this tape, although um, the other officer uh, from the um, Nelson detachment um, heard the tape. But regardless, controversy, it's kind of a two people saying one thing happened and then another group of people saying it didn't happen. So there is no tape now in existence. Um, they feel that it was more than likely recorded over uh, just because in the 80s uh, and 70s and so on, that's what they would do. You'd have the tape for so long that it would be recorded over. Police were able to uh, use DNA testing later on. And they were able to find out that uh, there were two specific donors at least to the DNA. So that would mean that there is more than one suspect um, that they should be looking for. However, police were really short-sighted. Um, we are gonna talk about this person in a few minutes. They basically had their sights set on this guy and because of this, they didn't really investigate any other tips or leads. Um, the family at one point in time had lost uh, the autopsy, the original autopsy uh, of Carrie. And when they tried to get it back, when they tried to get another copy, they were denied. And they believe it's because police did not want any of their mistakes to be known. Um, they also believe that this was not uh, a well-handled case and there are other people in the community that do believe this um, and it's also interesting to note that there are that there were charges laid at one point in time but they were revoked uh, this case is not um, solved it is actually Manitoba's largest unsolved uh, murder case and for 34 years, neither Carrie nor her family has had justice, neither have her friends. Uh, Nicole still has PTSD because of this. It affected a lot of people. Uh, there were a few suspects, and I do want everybody to know that the DNA profiles that were established were never released to the public or any other place. Uh, police have not commented on that, but they do have samples of DNA um, from all known suspects. Um, from the family and from friends. So this is what makes this case so hard to me. This is a really baffling case to me because if they do have this DNA, you would think they'd be able to link it up. To me, this seems to be that it would be the work of someone else, but we're going to get into that. So the list of suspects. Um, there are a few and... Um, they are very interesting to note. I think the most interesting aspect of this case, though, was that tape. I really wish they had been able to, the police had listened to this tape just to see um, what they could have heard. Uh, but they obviously did not. So, the suspects. The first guy was a man named Derek Herkert. And he was actually friends um, with Carrie. Um, he was questioned because he had a similar muscle car. A lot of people apparently in Thompson at this time drove a muscle car. He had a similar muscle car to the one identified uh, by Sean and uh, his friend. Uh, Carrie's dad and Derek's dad actually worked together, but he was quickly cleared as a suspect by the police. Um, the second suspect 
uh, was Mad Max Coons. Now we're going to call him Mad Max. That's what they called him in town, but his name is Max Coons. Uh, and he owned also a similar muscle car. It was a green car to the 1970s, um, one that was identified. He was driving around the streets that night of Thompson in the areas and police actually saw him and told him to get the vehicle off the road because it was too loud. So he switched cars and started driving a red car around. Now, while he was out in the area close to the stable roads, um, the, the entrance to stable road, a car, which was a 1970s muscle car, passed him, he said that it was brown, passed him on the shoulder of the road, not down the other lane, but on the shoulder of the road, which is really, really odd and also very dangerous. Um, and he did report that to the police. So Mad Max has been, um, eliminated as a suspect. Uh, with regards to the van, uh, all I know is that the owner was between 19 to 20 years old. Um, I really don't know if police um, ever identified this guy or if they ever spoke to him. Uh, all I know is that he was either 19 or 20 years old and he drove this white van and that the white van was following the muscle car. Um, I do also want people to know um, that when you're coming out of uh, Stable Road, which was gravel, I think a lot of the other roads around it before you reach the main highway were probably also rural. So I don't know how much paving um, was down around there. And um, it would seem like there was a lot of people in the area at the time, they just weren't on the specific road. So just do with that what you will. Um, Carlton Jackson was another man who was identified. Now, he was questioned by the police and then released. Um, he actually went to the Brown house and spoke to Jim and told Jim that he had nothing to do with this crime. It's really flimsy evidence that they have on Carlton, other than the fact that he had gone to a party given by Robert Delarond that night, and that he and another friend had left for an extensive amount of time around the time that Carrie disappeared. Um, I don't know for how long they left, but it was for an extensive amount of time. And then they came back to the party. Um, he was questioned by the police and released, but he was uh, held as a, su a suspect for a little bit of time. Uh, it's also known that at one point in time, Carlton was hit really hard in the head during a beating. And depending on who you ask, sometimes he remembers things, sometimes he doesn't. I don't know if this is just a convenient forgetting because he doesn't want to talk about it or if he actually does have head trauma. Um... The next person is Robert DeLaRond himself, the actual man that gave the party that night. Um, he was only implicated in this crime after he died. Now, he committed suicide by hanging in 1992, and this led a lot of people to believe that he may have been involved. Um, it was, what, uh, about six years later that he did this. Uh, now, Robert had a violent history, a somewhat violent history, and he was also bipolar. Um, which could have been another reason why he hung himself due to mental illness. Uh, what is interesting to note in this case, though, is that neither Robert's parents nor the mother of his child, uh, which he had had at, that, at uh, that point in time, would release DNA samples. Um, so we're talking about mitochondrial DNA at this point in time, um, just to see if uh, his DNA... Uh, would match up with the D any one of the samples that were found on uh, Carrie's body. <sighs> they said that they wouldn't give this because his parents said because they didn't want their son implicated in the crime, even though he was. Um, and the the mother of his child said that she didn't uh, believe that Robert could ever do anything like this, and that's why she wouldn't give the sample. Um, as far as I know, he's the only sample of DNA that they do not have. Um, it does seem, like I said before, that a lot of people suspect him due to the suicide. Was he hiding any secrets? Of course, we don't know about that. Um, there is actually a podcast on this case. Um, the host is a man named David uh, Ridgely. I believe it's David Ridgely. David Ridgey. 
Uh, David's done um, several years worth of this and uh, Carrie's um, disappearance is actually the fifth season of his podcast. It's called Someone Knows Something. Um, I urge you guys to watch it if you want to or at least uh, read the descriptions about it. That's where I got a lot of my information um, from. Uh, Trevor is in this. And so are a lot of the suspects, so are a lot of the community and the family members, so you're going to get a lot of information that way. Um, he actually spoke to a woman, David did, um, who had a boyfriend at the time. Now, this woman lived in Thompson, and her boyfriend in the, at the time uh, lived um, in Nelson in Nelson House, which is actually a set of um, four reserves of uh, Cree nationality um, that are about 80 kilometers away from Thompson. But like I said earlier, you know, people would drive into Thompson because it was basically the, the city at that point in time. She said that her boyfriend made reference one night to that white girl that got killed. That's all she said. Now, this man's name is Fred Spence, and Fred Spence actually denies any involvement in this crime. Um, there is no other evidence that links him at all, but she did tell the police that he had said, um, made a reference to the white girl that got killed. Um, it's interesting, though, because he may have known um, the person from Norway had, uh, he may have known the, um, the person, the officer that was asked for from there, and he does have, um, an accent. So could he have been the caller? It's unknown. Um, Fred Spence, like I said, Fred Spence, like I said, denies any involvement in this case. The biggest suspect of this time was the person who did have initial charges laid on him, and his name is Patrick Sumner. Patrick Sumner was 22 at this point in time, and he did drive um, a 70s, like a greenish-brownish 70s muscle car. This is basically how he was implicated, was from driving this around. And the RCMP did, um, especially tossed and held, did very much center in on him. In fact, he was a re arrested less than a week uh, after Carrie's body was found. Um, it is said that uh, his family owned the city dump, so they lived beside it. And several witnesses have said that they saw him cleaning out his car to a very extensive degree the next day, which would have been the Friday. Uh, that would have been October 17th, um, the day that it's hard to say because midnight is the cutoff point. Um, I'm going to say the day, basically, uh, that Carrie disappeared. He was cleaning out his car and he did so, so extensively. I've heard for five hours. And uh, he did this in a very public place, though, because the city dump was very high traffic. Um, he was a slight guy and he did have roughly hair. Um, Sean Simmons says he is still 90% sure that Patrick Sumner was the man he saw driving that muscle car that night. Now, it was dark, um, and he only basically had his headlights to see uh, this person, but he does stand by his statement. Um, police... Investigators, the original investigators, uh, tossed and held, both still believe that Patrick should not be ruled out as a suspect. Um, now, Patrick did voluntarily give hair samples and he did voluntarily take a lie detector test. Um, I don't know if he passed or not. I just know that he voluntarily took one. Um, when police uh, and uh, the hair samples would have DNA on them, I would assume that they would have checked that against him. But regardless... Um, the original investigators say not to um, rule him out. They say there's something there. There's still something there, whatever that means. Um, now, Patrick um, had a stain in his car. Um, and this is what police initially arrested him on was because uh, the stain was reddish in nature. Um, however... 
when it was tested, it turned out to be tomato juice. Um, he was also wearing, uh, well, they also seized a shirt from his house. Now, this shirt was too big for Patrick, and he pointed that out to people. It did have blood stains on it. And when the stain was typed at that time, because remember at that time, that's what they would have used was blood typing um, to figure out if the blood that they found was a... Um, a, B, and of course the positives and the negatives, and the blood type was Carrie's blood type. However, Patrick says this shirt was his dad's shirt and that the blood on the back of it, I'm sorry, it's not funny, the blood on the back of it was from his dad's pimples, his dad's back pimples. Um, he says that the blood was later forensically proven to be his dad's blood. Uh, police also claimed to have found hairs um, microscopically similar to that of Carrie's or consistent with Carrie's hairs. Um, I find this a little bit odd because officers said that the car was so clean because remember Patrick had cleaned it out extensively. The car was so clean that they couldn't even find his fingerprints. So I'm not quite sure how they found these hairs. But anyway, later testing revealed that these were not Carrie's hairs. He, Patrick sat in jail for about four months, um, almost five months for this crime. Um, during that time, he said that Tost told him that he should basically just confess to the crime because his life was over anyway. And in a way, his life was. Uh, there are still a lot of people in Thompson that believe he did this. Uh, and he's had a really hard time getting a job. Um, he's basically lost his life as well due to this because there's still so much suspicion surrounding him and there are still people who believe that he has done this um a judge in 1987 early 1987 i think it was march but don't quote me on that one i know it was early 1987 actually stayed the charges against him he basically had to throw out the charges because it was lack of evidence and this was during his preliminary hearing so though though patrick was charged with first degree murder the charges were dropped because there was no evidence and really a tomato juice stain a blood speckled shirt and hairs that just weren't even the same as Carrie's, as well as the fact that basically he had a muscle car and he washed it out too long the next day, according to people. That's what they had on Patrick. Um, now, Patrick has a friend named Claire Dubay, and they are still friends to this day. She actually is one of his supporters. And she says that she was with Patrick that night. Um, that's how she knows that he couldn't have done this. And basically, she said that Patrick would not harm a, harm a, harm a fly anyway. Sorry. Um, now when police looked at her alibi, because she had given the alibi for him, they noticed inconsistencies. Patrick says that he dropped, um, Claire off between 8 and 8.30, um, that night. So that would be October 16th. And then he drove to a bar and had a few drinks with a couple other friends and then he went home by about 10 o'clock and his mother was at home. Um, his mother says she doesn't remember what, what uh, she doesn't recall what time Patrick came in, though she does recall thinking he was just coming home late from work and she recalls him making a sandwich and then going to bed. Um, I don't know if she recalled anything about his clothing, anything like that. Um, Claire says that she actually went out for drinks with Patrick that night and that um, he took her home between 11 and 1230. That's quite a large time frame. Um, if it was closer to 11, then it remains to be seen. But if he had dropped her off closer to 1230, then that is a definite alibi. I mean, midnight was the time that Carrie disappeared and he would have been with Claire. Uh, but the timeline is really large. Um, she, Claire, um, also recalls in other interviews that police basically had their sights on Patrick and said, no, you know, your friend did this. And she said, no, even if he, if he had did this, she would definitely turn him in because she wants to know who killed Carrie just as badly. Now, in one of these interviews, um, police said to Carrie, or sorry, police said to Claire, 
that they theorized the reason why Patrick killed um, Carrie was because he, Patrick, had a crush on Claire, but was too afraid to say anything about it. And this requited love boiled over and he basically kidnapped and murdered Carrie because of this. Um, I guess Carrie did look similar to Claire. Um, and there was only about two years between the two, but Carrie just believes that this is a crap, crap theory. Um, first of all, if he had had a crush on her, he probably would have told her. And second of all, no one really even knows how Carrie and Patrick would have known each other. There was a seven year age difference between them, if you'll remember. Um, and a lot of people are insistent, um, at least the people that could alibi for him are insistent that he just, he doesn't have this in him. However, one of the friends um, from the bar, whose name is Lindsay, um, did say that he was with Patrick during the day, but they didn't hang out much at night, whatever that means, that they weren't together for very long during the night. Um, Now, Sumner, uh, Patrick himself, says that he washed his car not on the Friday, but on the Saturday, and he just did it because he felt his car was dirty. He says if he had had anything to hide, he would never have washed his car in such a high traffic place where so many people saw him. Remember, there were several witnesses that saw him doing this. Um, I don't even think he knew Carrie. Um, I don't think there was anything really that would ever link them together. It was basically just the fact that he owned this car. Um, but like I said, this did ostracize him from the community. Now, right now, uh, a woman named Jana Amaral runs um, the investigation now. Uh, Jana has heard about the tape. She says that she did go and speak to the officer from um, the Nelson detachment and uh, that nothing ever came of it. Uh, Marnie has still yet to be interviewed by police. It was only in the podcast that they talked to her. Um, Jana has also said that she does not rule uh, Patrick out as a suspect. Uh, I would assume at this point in time they have his DNA, but they say they can't rule him out as a suspect. Now, if you'll remember, there were at least two samples. That does not mean that there weren't more people involved, but there were at least two samples. Um, other than that, that's about it, folks. Um, this is a very interesting case. It's very bizarre. Even I don't have a theory on who may have done this. There are just too many angles that don't make sense. Number one, my first and foremost one, is the fact that it seems really convenient that within this 10 minute time frame, a vehicle pulled up to where Carrie was. Um, it, it, leads, it makes you wonder, did Carrie tell somebody else at the party that she wanted to leave? Doesn't really seem likely because we would have seen another set of footprints unless they left out a different uh, entryway. I don't know if there was a different entryway. I'm just saying it just seems really weird. Or did she call someone to come and pick her up? That could be another way. It just seems really convenient that the vehicle just happened to be there in that 10 minute time frame between when Nicole um, was talking to her, boy, her ex-boyfriend and when she went out the door. I also find it um, pretty interesting that Carrie was found with her jacket laying underneath of her and she was redressed or, or she had redressed, able to redress after the rape. Now, I know there were rumors going around that Carrie was found naked. She was not. Both police and Donna can confirm that she was not. Um, it would almost seem like it was someone that uh, cared about her or knew her in the very least, um, that they were laying the jacket down maybe so that she wouldn't get mud on her or would be more comfortable even though they did rape her and that they took the time to redress her or were able to let her get redressed um, so that police maybe wouldn't find her naked body in an 
be embarrassing or the body itself that it be embarrassing that's just my theory i don't really know um i i mean it could be possible that the suspects let her redress so that um they could hide evidence it was 1986 remember that that would prove that they were unsophisticated um Another thing that seems weird to me is that it seems like she voluntarily got into the vehicle. Um, remember the fresh tire tracks that were at Doug's house. It seems like she voluntarily got in there. Now, if she did, it would seem that this was someone or at least someone she knew was in the vehicle. Um, I know they said there were two sets of cars, so or two sets of vehicles, sorry. So it would lead me to believe that she knew someone in the vehicle. Um, I don't. Obviously, I can't know if there's more than one person that was in the vehicle, but it would it would seem that she would have known this person. I mean, hitchhiking in 1986 was still very much a thing. It just seems really strange that a car pulled up at that point in time. She could have been hitchhiking with someone she didn't know, just trying to get a ride home, but she wasn't very far from home. That That is another thing. I know it was a really cold night that night, but she was not very far from home. Um... And depending on which home she was going to, was she going to Nicole's home, her own home? Regardless, she did end up out at the scene. Now, if somebody had a gun on her or a knife on her and told her to get in, I mean, that would account for them never having to leave their seat. But if they did, why would they beat her with branches and not use a different weapon? It seems like this was a crime of opportunity. Um, maybe they didn't originally... Uh, go to go out there to kill her maybe the person that was driving thought that carrie would have relations with him and when she refused he the people got angry beat her because she was beaten really badly guys so what did she do or say during that time frame that made these these individuals so angry that they would beat her to death with sticks she was beaten to death with sticks guys that that is a very hard way to die, um, particularly her head, her face, and her upper torso region. Um, there was a lot of anger there. Um, could this have been somebody that had a crush on Carrie and, you know, offered her a ride home and she rebuffed their advances, so they took this out on them? Could it have been someone she know, knew and a stranger from somewhere else that they knew? And maybe they both thought she would be willing to do something with them and she wasn't. Was it the fact that they drove there specifically just to do this for Carrie? Had they already targeted Carrie? Um, there are too many unknowns in this case. Um, so much so that, once again, I, I, I myself don't believe that Patrick is the person involved in this. There, there don't seem to be any clear links between them. Um, Trevor, for what it's worth, her brother, uh, did meet with Patrick during the podcast and he also doesn't believe that Patrick had anything to do with his sister's murder. Regardless guys it's been 34 years. 34 years where people have been waiting for answers. Now in 2016 the, the RCMP did something really neat and they tweeted about the case all day using Carrie's voice saying you know my name's Carrie I'm I'm this age, I'm this height, today I did this and this, and then it just gets darker and darker up to the moment of the crime. Um, they did tweet about it all day in the hopes that it would renew interest in the case and that they could get and further generate more tips. Um, the United States has actually started doing this too uh, because they were inspired by this case. Um, and that was in 2016 on the 30th anniversary. Um, the RCMP detachment is still very open to finding tips, very open to finding information on this case because there is actually so little information. Um, if you guys do know anything or if you know of anybody that knows anything, you can contact uh, Jana, or, um, sorry, uh, Jana Amaralt at the RCMP uh, detachment in Thompson. She's the one that heads this case now. You guys know you can call your local police and hopefully they'll pass on the information. Call the RCMP um, and hopefully they'll pass on information. Although I would say if you do have information, contact Jana. Um, contact her firsthand. Don't do it secondhand. Sometimes information gets lost. Or you can call Crime Stoppers, guys. Like I said, it's completely anonymous. Um, that's it for today, guys. Uh, I hope that you found this case as interesting that I, as I do. Um, if you guys have any theories, let me know. 
if you guys think there's another suspect i'd love to find out what uh anybody else knows about this case if there's anything i missed let me know um hopefully you guys will have a great next week and we'll come back with another crime from another area um and hopefully uh tips will be generated from this and the police will be able to solve uh who killed carrie ann thompson which is the longest running crime unsolved crime in uh the largest unsolved crime in uh in Manitoba, not longest, largest unsolved crime in Manitoba. Um, I hope you guys all have a really great week. And if you're new to the channel, please, please, please remember to like, subscribe, hit that old notification bell and leave me some comments, guys. Let me know who do you guys think killed Carrie Ann Brown. Until next time. Bye.